Hello everyone, uh, it's great to be able to have this opportunity to share with you today. And uh, you may have heard this passage preached on, I don't know, a few times or several times before. And I have to say, I've heard some pretty great preaches on it over the years. So I just kind of ask that as, as you listen, please think about what God is saying to you today through this, rather than think, oh, I've heard all this before because you might miss something. So let's let's pray to begin with. Father God, as we come to you, as we come to your word, uh, we ask, Lord, that you would speak to us, uh, that you would help us to hear your voice and act on it. Lord, may your word in our hearts grow up and produce fruit in our lives for your glory. Amen. So, in, in John 14, the bit just before this uh, passage that was so wonderfully read, Jesus is talking to his disciples about the coming of the Holy Spirit and about going away, you know, about leaving his disciples. In verse 29, he says, I have told you now before it happens so that when it does happen, you will believe. And this to me implies that actually at that moment of him telling his disciples, they don't believe him. But actually there will be a point when they do. Then at the end of John 14, he says, come now, let us leave. But it seems that they don't, because Jesus then starts a new subject, a new conversation. Or is he explaining something maybe a little more? or a little further to his disciples because they still don't get what he's talking about. And I wonder about them sometimes, you know, this group of followers who have been living with Jesus, who are uh, spending time with him, uh, and they just don't get a lot of what he says. And I wonder, what's, what's the hope for me? However, we have uh, lots of insight from other people from over the years. Um, so we get a perspective on it that they didn't have. The opener of John 15 is this. I am the true vine. It's another one of those I am claims, isn't it, that Jesus makes relating to him being the I am of ancient times, alluding to Jesus himself being God him being God in person form. The last three Sundays we have had um, in this order, I am the light of the world, I am the gate, and I am the good shepherd. And on each of these occasions, Jesus was addressing a group of people, including some Pharisees and teachers of the law. These claims then enraged his onlookers and listeners. This time, however, the audience is different. The audience is just his disciples. This conversation is meant specifically for those who are already following him. For you and for me. Well, I suppose, of course, if you're listening or watching this sermon and you're not a follower of Jesus, then actually in this moment, you can turn to him. And when you do, you can know that there is freedom from sin and there is everlasting life if you put your faith in Jesus. I am the true vine, Jesus says. Well, let's unpack that a little further. The word true here is pretty interesting actually and it has a, a detailed definition and it's this. That which has not only the name and resemblance but the real nature corresponding to the name in every respect corresponding to the idea signified by the name. Sounds a bit wordy, doesn't it? So I'll just read that again. That was, I'll have a go at reading that again. 
That which has not only the name and resemblance, but the real nature corresponding to the name, in every respect corresponding to the idea signified by the name. So, when Jesus is saying he is the true vine, he is saying that everything about the reality of the vine, about what I'm saying about the vine, is true of me. His claim to be the true vine is not a comment on other false vines or anything like that. Rather, it's the truth of him being the vine that is utterly dependable. Now remember, he is talking to a group of people who are already following him. He then quickly establishes that his father, that is God in heaven, is the gardener or vine dresser. And um, the word gardener is used in um, uh, my Bible because actually we don't know what it really means in our culture, so it's often translated as gardener, but it actually means vine dresser. So someone who specifically looks after vines and knows all about vines and knows what to do with vines. And, uh, and Jesus then proceeds to talk about the role of the vine dresser in caring for the vine so that it is fruitful and healthy. See, if a vine was left to its own devices, it grows fairly quickly and fairly wildly and madly, and it grows in all sorts of directions. But one of the things about uh, vines, if left, is that they harbour pests, and then they become a problem for nearby healthy vines. Its fruit is small and often useless, and it needs to be tended in specific ways to maximise production and to be the most fruitful. So what does a vine dresser do? So if Jesus is saying, I'm the true vine and my father is the vine dresser, what, what is the father's role in this? Well, he starts by cutting off every branch that bears no fruit. But cuts off every branch in the vine in Christ that bears no fruit. So that means that if you are in Christ, yet bear no fruit, you are cut off from him, doesn't it? It seems to imply that. And that sounds a bit scary. And of course it makes sense if you're going to tend to a plant. You'd, you'd get rid of the rubbish, wouldn't you, first? You'd get rid of all the all the unproductive bits, the, the wild looking bits, the, the offshoots, the things that are not going to be fruit bearers. You get rid of all that. So the life and energy in the plant's sap could go to the places where it could be most effective, most productive. And this was how ancient vine dre dressers um, husbanded their crops. Or was it? Actually, it wasn't. That isn't what they did. You see, the word that we read as cut off literally means to, to raise, to, to take up or, or, or lift. The vine dresser would not know which branches were going to be fruitful until evidence of the fruit appeared on those branches. And some of those branches would begin to fruit a bit later in the season than others especially the lower ones or the ones dragging on the floor. So the person tending the vine would literally lift them up and spread them out so they would get air to them and that prevents them from rotting. And also they'd have the opportunity to become fruitful. So those branches in Christ the vine producing no fruit would be lifted up and given opportunity first. Then, as the fruit developed on the other branches, if they, those ones were not producing fruit, they were cut off. So the cutting off still does happen, but the opportunity is there first. There's a parable that Jesus tells in, in Luke 13, 6 to 8, that kind of um, addresses this a bit. I'll just read that to you. 
Um, then he told this parable. See, I told you it was a parable. A man had a fig tree growing in his vineyard, and he went to look for fruit on it, but did not find any. So he said to the man who took care of the vineyard, For three years now I've been coming to look for fruit on this fig tree and haven't found any. Cut it down. Why should it use up the soil? Sir, the man replied, leave it alone for one more year and I'll dig round it and fertilise it. If it bears fruit next year, fine. If not, then cut it down. You see, God is not without mercy. He is not without grace. He wants to work his life in us and through us so that we produce fruit. But more about that shortly. So the first thing that the uh, vine dresser does, he cuts off every branch or lifts up every branch that bears no fruit. And next, the fruit bearing branches are pruned. Imagine that. They're actually cut right back, not just trimmed. This is so that in the coming season they pr produce more fruit, so they're even more fruitful. The word for prune here also means cleansed or, or cleaned. But why would God do that to his people? Why would he prune them? Why would he prune me? So imagine you're doing you know, really quite well. Your life is being fruitful for God and, and suddenly it, it kind of gets cut back. Some tragedy occurs. I don't know, your life is being fruitful for God and suddenly, again, a difficulty arises or, I don't know, you lose your job or you get demoted or you're having to deal with a whole variety of challenges. But this could be your normal life as well. I think to understand it better, we, we need to know what the fruit actually is. And for this, we need to look at verse 8 in this passage that was read to us. And the fruit is showing yourselves to be the disciple of Christ or the disciples of Jesus. I think the best concise description of this fruit is found in um, Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And you, it might be familiar to you. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness and self-control. Now it might be that you know these verses really well. I mean I'm, I'm pretty familiar with them myself but if you think about it someone who shows these attributes is in increasing measure will be very noticeable in our self-centered culture. Impatience and intolerance is on a sharp increase. Certainly gentleness and kindness seem to be becoming scarcer. Have you, have you noticed that? Maybe you've noticed other things as well and it's likely if you really examine our culture in the light of kind of these spiritual fruits you'll notice a decline in some areas, maybe significantly so. What do you think? This means a disciple of Jesus should be becoming more noticeable just on that basis. Well, that's a thought anyway. Okay, so back to pruning. The fruitfulness in those areas mentioned in Galatians are usually only increased through suffering, through hardships, through difficulties and hard work. There, there's no shortcut, pardon the pun. To grow in kindness, your current level of kindness needs to be challenged. To grow in patience or forbearance, you need to be able to wait longer or able to endure for longer under difficult circumstances. None, none of this is nice. It is a hard pruning that we go through and a cleansing that enables us to be more Christ-like, clearly revealing Christ in us and showing the world through
through us that we are his disciples. I mentioned this verse uh, last Tuesday, Revelation 1, verse 9. And it says this, I, John, he's the chap that's writing this letter, uh, Revelation, your brother and companion in the suffering and kingdom and patient endurance that are ours in Jesus. And Paul, uh, he writes as well, doesn't he, in Romans 5, verse 3 and 4. We also glory in our sufferings because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character, hope. Suffering is something that no one would choose. Yet Spurgeon says this about it. Uh, when actually looking at this particular passage, he says, Say not, dear friends, that your afflictions must be caused by your sins. Nay, rather, they may come in consequence of your virtues. Because, sorry, because you do bear fruit, it is worthwhile for the husband the husbandman, that's the vine dresser, that's the Father God, to use his knife upon you, that you may bring forth more fruit. So he's saying these hardships, these difficulties that we are suffer, are as a result of God pruning us so that we become even more fruitful. And so... The father who Jesus describes as the master gardener or vine dresser lifts the fruitless branches, giving them opportunity to be fruitful. And if they're not, he gets rid of them. And then he prunes the fruitful ones so that they become more fruitful. Jesus then tells his followers to remain or abide in him. Again, using the vine as the example. For the branches to have life, the sap from the main stem needs to flow in them. Not only will they into them, or not only will they be fruitless, they will wither and die. He continues by reiterating his point. I don't know if you know this, but in the Bible, when uh, there's a repetition, that's either in the Hebrew or in the Greek. But in, in both of these cultures, it means that the point is that's being made is really important. It's like he's saying, come on, guys, you really need to get this. I am the vine and you're the branches. Remain in me. And if you do, you will bear much fruit. You see, the fruit comes from abiding and not trying to bear fruit. So let's think about something that we're more familiar with, maybe. Um, the apple blossom. Does it strain to become fruitful once it's been pollinated? Or does the fruit simply grow because it's part of the tree? Can you imagine that? The fruit on the tree going... Straining to grow. No, it grows because it's part of the tree. And it's the same with us when we abide in Christ. It is him, it is Christ that grows the fruit of the Spirit in us. Are you struggling to be kind? Well, abide in Christ. Struggling to love the unlovely? Abide in Christ. You see, the great thing is it, it takes the pressure off. Jesus repeated it to his disciples because they and we really need to understand this. And then comes this crunch line. Apart from me, you can do nothing. It reminded me of Hebrews 11.6, which says, and without faith, it's impossible to please God. That, that phrase there. Hebrews 11.6 does continue as well. It says, because anyone who comes to him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who 
earnestly seek him. But for me, there's also something more here. There's something about what it means to be in Christ, in the vine. And the term in Christ appears 93 times in the New Testament. And if you uh, add that to, well, there's also the term in him, meaning also in Christ. And that's another 84 times on top of that. It's about being clothed in Christ, literally being you know, covered by him and all that he is. You know, he is our, our salvation, our, our strength, our joy. He's our, our hope, our provision. He, he is our guide and, and, and more and so much more. Hopefully you can think of things that Christ is, is for you as well in this moment. Uh, please feel free to even pause this and have a chat with those around you. You know, what is Christ to you? Try and think of as many as you can. Go on, have a, have a go. And if you are in Christ, then you have accepted his lordship. You have accepted his sovereignty. You have accepted that he is your father, that Christ is your brother. And that his life is in you as you are in him. If you are in Christ, you are one with him. Because without his life, his sap, as it were, flowing in us and even through us, we can bear no fruit. And then after Jesus talks a little bit more about the uselessness of branches that get removed, you know, they just get chucked in the fire. I like burning uh, branches and maybe one or two of you do as well. Um, so they're handy to keep us warm, but that's about it. They're, they are then no more. They cannot produce fruit anymore. And after talking about that, he says, one of the most difficult verses in the New Testament for me. Yeah, he says this. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Now, that is a fantastic promise from Jesus. Now, over the years, I've read many commentaries about this, and I still haven't found one that provides me with a satisfactory answer to what Jesus is meaning here. And it might be that you're thinking, well, you should know, Dave, you're, you're one of the ministers. And I've even been asking God about it today. But you know what? I think sometimes it's OK to not get it. It's OK to, to not understand really what God is saying, but to say to him, I don't, I don't get it. I don't understand the, the depth and the breadth of this promise fully. Help me to understand, but I trust in you for this. There are two conditions that need to be met here for this uh, asking whatever you wish and it will be done for you. The first one is remaining in Christ. Again, it's abiding, 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 abiding. Can't emphasise that enough. Say it one more time. Abiding. It's remaining. It's being in Christ. Condition one. Condition two. Having Christ's words remaining in us, remaining in me. Now, some people talk of this as Jesus referring to, to spiritual things, like asking to be more fruitful or praying for the lost, that those things come into this. But Jesus does not put that condition on. He, the two conditions, he says, are remaining in Christ and Christ's words remaining in us. There's no other condition on this sentence. And... Maybe the intention here, though, is for us to make sure that we abide in him and to make sure that his word is in us. Psalm 119 verse 11 says, I have hidden your word in my heart that I might not sin 
against you. And maybe Jesus was um, talking to his disciples with that in mind, this idea that his word in us is what enables us to resist sin. I mean, in verse 3 of John 15, he says, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. So that's cleansing through his word. And his word needs to remain in us. So however you think about that verse, however you think about this idea of asking whatever you wish for and it being done for you, however you struggle or grapple with that or have no problem with it whatsoever, there are some things that are very clear about it. We must abide in Christ and him abide in us so that the fruit that I've previously mentioned will grow and be produced in our lives, showing us to be disciples of Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I am the true vine. In him, lifting, pruning, cutting out takes place to enable fruitfulness. Aside from him, we can do nothing. In him, we can do all things, showing ourselves to be his disciples. So let us abide in the vine this day. Now this, this next song has that as its title, um, Abide With Me. How easy do you find it to abide with Jesus? Do you find yourself kind of abiding with him one minute and then, I don't know, coming out of him a, a, a next minute? Does it feel a little bit like that sometimes? Well, if, if that's you, then, then it might be like you're someone who feels like your, your feet is in both camps, one foot in with Christ and one foot in the world. And Jesus doesn't want us to be lukewarm for him. No, he wants us to be people who are wholeheartedly following him with all our mind, our soul and our strength. So let's return to him with all of our heart as he desires us to, and abide with him again. Let's worship him as we sing this next song, Abide With Me. Amen. <laughs>